If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Hello and welcome to the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your host as always, Chris McDaniel, a political reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. I'm joined today by... Jason Rosenbaum of the St. Louis Beacon. Joe Manis of the St. Louis Beacon. After the tragic events that took place in Connecticut on Friday, many have been looking to our elected officials to do something about it, so that something can be changed for the future. Um, on a national level, uh, President Obama has announced a task force being led by the vice president. Um, Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill has voiced her support for a ban on assault weapons. Well, re- reinstating the 1994 to 2004 right. assault weapons ban uh, and Senator Blunt, Roy Blunt, I talked to him on Saturday, and I talked to him again on uh, Wednesday. Um, he's He is not saying specifically that he he's against it, although he's sending out signals that he is, but he's being very careful uh, with his wording, which indicates that, you know, I think it depends on the proposal. Um, he But he's basically saying that the bigger focus needs to be on mental health and on tracking People who are mentally ill and have a potential for violence, that's where he would like to see the focus. And um, he's a former educator, so actually he takes somewhat of a cool view to what Jason's been hearing in the General Assembly. Well, well, I'm, I'm blunt. For just a little bit yeah. more. On Saturday, he told the Kansas City Star that he didn't think Sunday. federal— No, that was Monday. Yeah, that was Monday. That was Monday. He told the Kansas City Star that he didn't think federal gun laws would change anytime soon. And then in a conference call with reporters yesterday, he he didn't take a step back from it, but he did admit that he said that he was too willing to talk about what would happen well, in the future. Well, look at the practical composition— of the United States Congress. You have a Republican right. House, and Republicans, by and large, tend not to favor gun control laws, although that's not absolute. Sure. And, and then— in And the, many Democrats, too. And there are some Democrats, because there's been this specific strategy on the part of Democrats to appeal more in, you know, less Democratic states by finding politicians that, you know, are against abortion and— ascribed to be pro-Second Amendment. And I mean, a lot of that is similar in the Senate, although you've seen some major movement, quote unquote, pro-gun senators like Joe Manchin and Joe Donnelly, you know, talk about how there there could be a conversation. Now, what that conversation is and what they're willing to do, you know, is is unclear. But the reason I bring that up is, I mean, while while blunt statement might be jarring in the light of this event, I mean, it's basically mm-hmm. speaking to the practical realities of, of Congress. Right. Sure. And so, so on Wednesday, he kind of walked it back to what he said on Saturday when he was here. And I talked to him and also um, Mr. Lloyd from your. Yes, uh, from St. Louis Public Radio. Yeah, from St. Louis Public Radio and then another radio reporter. We were the only three reporters who were there. So he talked to us at length, and at that one, he really didn't when, – when when we asked him specifically about the assault weapons and that sort of thing, he sort of demurred and kept it focused on uh, the mental health issues. And uh, I did ask him, though, about the, the emerging talk at that time of possibly arming teachers or putting more guns in the hands of administrators. And Blunt, who is the former uh, teacher and who also – had been a former president of a university in southwest Missouri, was very cool to that idea. And on Mm -hmm. Wednesday, he was equally cool. He didn't come out and say he was against it, but he raised a lot of questions about it. I think his quote was, I'm not sure that that's the takeaway from this, that we should have more guns in schools. Well, right. That's what he was saying. But that's the exact piece of legislation that was introduced on the 18th. Go ahead. Talk about that. And it was by Representative Mike Kelly of Lamar. Mm -hmm. He introduced this bill that would allow teachers or administrators to, with concealed carry permits, to carry on in a school. Um, He told me that there's a lot of details that aren't fleshed out yet, like, you know, where a gun would have to be placed, whether it be in a safe or whether it be on on the person, or whether there would have to be some sort of alert system to teachers telling administrators or administrators telling superintendents, you know, that they have a gun. 
you know, Joe and I were talking beforehand about the liability issues that would probably have to be be worked out. But bottom line is, I mean, that was an idea that was floated not not just by Republican legislators, but also by St. Louis County Police Chief Tim Finch. Right. Um, I believe he he talked about that on Monday, and it caused a pseudo national news for him bringing that up. Right, he talked about it on Monday, and then he did more interviews on Tuesday. He was on St. Louis on the air yesterday on Wednesday. He uh, he was on national news too for for NPR. Now, St. Louis County Executive Charlie Dooley, who I talked to on Tuesday after the county council meeting, and several of us asked him about um, Fitch, who, and uh, Dooley didn't take a stand directly on it, but he said there likely needed to be a discussion on more security in public school districts. But he specifically made clear that this is a decision before the pu- for the public school districts, which, frankly, uh, in Missouri, are pretty much their own little kingdoms. Uh, that he said, you know, it's kind of up to them. Now, there are two ways, two points of discussion on this. And uh, I want to say first, I'm from a family of teachers. My dad was a teacher and an administrator. My sister's a teacher. This is in another state. But uh, my husband's a former teacher. So uh, I'm a, I, grew, I understand some of the culture on this as far mm-hmm. as where the teachers look at it. Um, there is, I mean, the liability issue is not a minor issue because let's say, for example, if if you're going to allow a teacher or administrator to be armed, they there's the potential, especially, I mean, that uh, in a junior high or high school, they would have to be careful as far, like if they're wearing it on their person, that it could be snatched from them and used against other students. And uh, the school district would be mucho liable on that extent. If they keep it locked up, um, even then, um, uh, I can attest from family experience that locking up something valuable uh, doesn't necessarily mean a student still won't get in it and get it. And uh, if, uh, let's say, in a grade school, the the teachers have to keep it locked up, well, A, kids could, might still get in there, and then what happens, how the district might be liable if, there's, if a kid hurts another kid. Or, in the case of what happened on Friday, if somebody shows up with an assault weapon in your schoolroom and starts blasting, you're not going to have time to go to your desk or, or your safe and unlock and get the gun. Maybe the uh, others in the building might have more time to do that, um, but... It's unclear whether or not that really would have changed what happened on Friday because virtually all the deaths took place within a few minutes. And and it occurs by people, you know, most of the time wearing some sort of bulletproof vest and people who, you know, aren't concerned with their with their own lives. I I, I just want to point out that that wasn't the only idea that's been floated in light of this. Uh, I talked with Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal of University City, who's also a school board member of the University City School District. Yes, good point. And uh, I, I really wanted to reach out with her because I thought she had a different perspective than a lot of legislators and, legislators. and, you know, she was just kind of dealing with the aftermath, the fact that two University City School District students had been shot dead, even one before and one after this. And from talking with her, it was kind of a multifaceted approach in her eyes. You know, part of it's gun safety and possibly restrictions on firearms, but a lot of it is taking a look broadly at how schools are are dealing with the issue of school safety, how they're kind of reacting when a student may show signs of mental illness, something more broad. She didn't really say she had a specific answer because she said that a lot of this hasn't been studied yet. But if that's something the legislature pursues, you know, it may not provide, you know, right or wrong answers per se. It might provide a lot of solutions that are going to cost money and may have unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't surprise me that if if that became more of a consensus idea to react to this sort of thing than than, uh, Representative Kelly's bill, which I'm not saying, as I said on this earlier, you never want to say something's never going to pass or will pass. Correct. (laughs) Uh, but, But something like that is, I think, even a proponent of that idea uh, Stan Cox told me it, it's not going to be something that's going to be, you know, 
it's it, it's gonna it's gonna be something that's gonna encounter a lot of resistance and controversy. So it will remain to be seen what will happen on a state legislative level. But I know that other states are looking at this, you know, in in different ways. I think I saw that the governor of Colorado was announcing, you know, examination of their mental health system, and I think uh, Governor Quinn of Illinois. I saw a press release about, you know, kind of looking at school safety issues. So this is going to be something that state legislators, I think, everywhere are going to be looking at, at least for now. So um, I, th- I think there definitely will be a discussion about it, mm-hmm. whether or not, I mean, what happens with it. But I think uh, people do need to realize, regardless, I mean, I'm not taking a stand on this or anything, but what you see in movies where somebody's able to take out the killer with one shot and the killer doesn't have body armor right. or whatever. It's not, I mean, real life isn't the movies. Yeah. So regardless of, and I think uh, that's, for good or bad, that's true. And I think uh, this this will at least at least at a discussion. And uh, as journalists, we love to cover discussions. Yeah. Well, it's looking like the special election for Joanne Emerson in Missouri's 8th Congressional District might happen sooner than we had previously expected, right, Joe? Possibly, but there's no guarantee. Here's kind of what's happened. Uh, Secretary of State Robin Carnahan, as everyone here knows, uh, about a week ago uh, put out an estimate uh, saying that to hold this special election— In southeast Missouri's 8th district, which now actually comes up to the bottom half of Jefferson County, uh, it's going to cost him about a million dollars for this special election to select the to elect the successor to U.S. Representative Joanne Emerson, who announced a few weeks after her reelection that she was leaving in early February to take a job as national head of the national Electric, I mean, Rural Electric Cooperative Association, which is basically the uh, conglomerate of several thousand rural uh, electric cooperatives, which is where many rural people get their electricity, and uh, which is pays a lot more, probably close to two million bucks a year with benefits. So, and uh, she's very excited about it, and she has a lot of expertise in that area. So, uh, she will likely be a strong. Uh, head of that new uh, of that association. That said, all the jockeying here is over who might replace her. The uh, party leaders pick the nominees. But anyway, she has said she would leave. Her last day in office would be February eighth. Well, since then, the congressional schedule has come out, and the House U.S. House will actually be out uh, as of February sixth for a few days. So when I was talking to her uh, campaign, I mean, her press person over the weekend, um, he confirmed that she now is offering to uh, actually resign sooner if the governor, Jay Nixon, who formally will call the election, if he will call it for April 2nd, which is a normally scheduled uh, statewide election date in Missouri, where municipalities and school districts already have stuff on the ballot. And the idea being it would save a lot of money. Yeah. Let me tell you why that might be in, you know, I don't, I am not a political strategist and I do not dispense advice, but let me tell you a scenario why that may be in in the Democrats' best interest to follow Joe Emerson, Joanne Emerson's uh, request. Now, we've talked before about on this podcast, this possibility that, you know, Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder might get this nomination. There's He's uncertainty. From Cape Girardeau, yeah. There's some uncertainty about what would happen, whether the governor can appoint his, his successor, whether they're. He know. has appointed successors in the not yeah. this governor, but other governors. Well, so, yeah. You know, as you you mentioned, and the Republicans t- challenged t- yeah, that. Yeah, Tim Jones, the the House Speaker from Eureka, has has floated the idea of possibly passing a law to make all statewide officials. Um, you know, elected through a special election. Correct. Well, if they, if if, if the writing's on, if the election's going to be in April, and the writing on the wall is that Kinder's going to get the nomination, even if they pass that bill, there's no, I, I don't know what the timeline Nixon has to, to veto that bill, but I mean, if they pass it really close to that election, there's there's no guarantee that Nixon is going to to veto or sign or take any action. 
until, you know, after the election happens. So it, it makes me think that, you know, if that does happen, um, it, it could just be a situation where they're not going to be able to institute something like that in time for, for that office to be vacant and for, for Kinder to be to be put there. So, I mean, there will still be uncertainty either way, because if Nixon tries to appoint somebody, I mean, there could be a court challenge or there could be a lot of different other things. But it would kind of make the timeline harder for Republicans to go forward with changing the law if it was, you know, still within the legislative session, as opposed to in August, when I believe Nixon would have to take action on that bill by 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 July. So I don't know. It's hard. to Well, say. it depends. There's a time frame within after a bill passes. But I think Nixon so far hasn't said anything yeah. at all about what Emerson has said. And you're aware when I and you're correct. When I talked to Speaker Jones last week, he did talk about that bill. And uh, but I think that um, I think one of the reasons the Republicans are starting to look at that bill is because they may realize while if you look at the wording in the Constitution, there are questions about whether or not the lieutenant governor should be if there's a vacancy should be appointed by the governor. Mm. But there's a there's a trail of action yeah. Where at least two or three times governors have appointed the replacements, which means that the courts might well say, well, this has been the pattern. You can't question it now, 150 years later. And uh, so by passing the bill, it's probably the smarter thing for the Republicans to do to eliminate any questions about this. Right. And I and I may have just my explanation of that may have not been the 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 most clear and i just think the bottom line is if it's in april i just think that the legislative trajectory for that type of bill is going to be a lot harder to accomplish i mean again i can't predict the future i'm not a strategist there could be a certain time frame where the governor has to act even if they pass it within the legislative session i i frankly don't know the answer to that but i mean it just seems like getting that through in an April election where there would be a result and there would probably be a vacancy pretty quickly, it would just be a difficult thing to pull off. And and, and, and this may be academic. I mean, Lloyd Smith, sure. who's the executive director, who had been the executive director of Missouri Republican Party, a former top aide to Emerson, also looking at this, um, he's already stepped down presumably to start – talking to all these Republican leaders in the district, um, I think uh, we should know, I'm betting, within a few weeks, at least behind the scenes, who's got the edge among these uh, Republican leaders. And that may be another motive for Emerson. Uh, She may want to, as soon as, okay, presumably, although she's not endorsing anybody, but presumably she would sort of behind the scenes favor Smith. If Smith happens to get the support lined up, she may want to step out and get them to name him as soon as possible and not drag it out Mm -hmm. and give uh, Kinder or one of the other various ex or current legislators who are looking at it time to outmaneuver Smith. Well, here's my question. Um, Do you feel that Smith would be a strong enough – if he's picked as the nominee, he'll probably win the special election and right. be a congressman. But do you think he's strong enough to ward off, you know, the endless list of people we've talked about in 2014? I don't know. I think it depends on the climate. I mean, I've known Lloyd for a long time. He's a real sharp guy. I think some of it will depend on what issues come in, come up in Washington. I think it'll some of it will depend on whether or not other Republicans deem him vulnerable and part of it will have to do with money raising. Uh, yeah. Like I've said, I've, I mean, I've heard conflicting things. Yes. Like some people say yes, some people say no. And I could see a scenario where like an Ann Wagner type scenario, you know, she, like Lloyd Smith, they she was never in elected office. But she raised powerful behind the scenes. She was powerful behind the scenes. She raised so much money in the run up to that primary that really any other person who was thinking about it wasn't going to be able to really compete. And I could see a similar scenario happening like that but i don't i don't know it's hard to say at this point in time it, well, it really because will a depend on these, a lot of factors well and a lot of these people i mean she and lloyd know each other really well yeah so i mean it could be that some of the more um uh establishment republicans like um like like wagner and others 
if they line now, this is assuming that they would line up behind Smith. They might not. Right. I mean, but some of them had defected from Kinder because of the um, stripper problem mm-hmm. <laughs> a year ago. So, um, you know, it, it's this behind the scenes drama. Now, one thing is on Wednesday, I did ask um, Blunt because I had heard that he might, as a, as arguably the most influential Republican currently in office in the state, mm. that he might play some sort of behind the scenes role. And he denied that he said he wasn't going to get involved, which I thought he was pretty specific about that. Yeah. I thought, well, that kind of curbed some of the speculation that was out there. Well, let's close out with some good news here. Joe, I'm I'm hearing that the state budget is is looking to be a little bit better this year. Yeah, this budget is, problems are, are well, bad. of course, and hey, these are projections and things right. can happen. But uh, the staff for the Senate and House budget leaders and the governor's uh, budget people had been spending the last couple of weeks negotiating on what sort of uh, estimated revenue would be for fiscal year 2014, which begins July 1st. Because, frankly, most of the legislative session is spent putting together a budget. I mean, right. that's like the main thing that they do. And the bottom line is they agreed on a um, estimate, and for the general revenue, it'll be just under $8 billion, and it's about $237 million more than what they are, appear to be taking in this year. Mm-hmm. Now, what's key about that? That's not a lot of money. But what's key is that this is the first time in since 2008 where the projection has been higher than the previous year. I mean, as far as without any cuts planned and with no reliance on federal money. This will be the first uh, budget, frankly, since uh, the governor took office where they won't need or hope for a big infusion of federal money to mm-hmm. um, to balance it much less, and that there's already talk of what cuts need to be made. This time for this budget, no one's saying we're going to have to cut anything. They're, they're not saying they're going to have to add money, but they're indicating that if things go as planned, they actually might have a cushion of a few hundred million dollars, and that's even with the business franchise tax continually being phased out. So that for that standpoint, if their estimate turns out to be true, that's good news. Well, that just about does it for the Politically Speaking podcast this week. Uh, You can find all of our stories at beyondnovember.org. You can find all of my stories at stlpublicradio.org. You can find all of Joe and Jason's stories at stlbeacon.org. You can follow me on Twitter at at CSMcDaniel. You can follow Jason on Twitter at... Jay Rosenbaum. And Joe Manny's at... At Jay Manny's. I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, and this will likely be... The last of the year. uh, We're taking next week off. We think we've earned it. Uh, and we, we think our listeners have probably earned it, too. <laughs> but uh, Joe, Joe and I will actually be on St. Louis on the Air next Wednesday at 11 to talk about politics and this year in politics. The so, day after Christmas. Day so after Christmas. we'll still be so around. So don't worry. <laughs> if, if you're missing our voices around the Christmas time, don't worry. And you Jason will be it. out of town on assignment. <laughs> in Chicago. <laughs> If assignment means loafing around and eating pierogies, then I plan to get an A on that assignment. (laughs) Well, we will be back at the start of the new year. Until then, so long. So long. So long. The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts.